Hey guys, today we're chatting with Shane Archibald, or better known as the flying mullet to you guys. There's no doubt he's got the most recognisable haircut in the professional peloton, but he's also got a pretty impressive resume as a bike rider. He's a Commonwealth Games gold medalist, an Olympian, and he's the current New Zealand road champion. But George and I know him better as Novi. He's a mate of ours, and we've grown up racing with him over all these years. And we know him especially well for all the dribble that comes out of his mouth. So welcome to episode one of The Social Distance with the Flying Mullet. Yep, we are. Recording started. All right, mate. Here we are. This is our podcast. <laughs> they don't want to be locked into a, a house or an apartment or some space. Got to follow the social distancing rule. More social distancing keeps more people healthy. It's like, oh, you guys could have talked shit. Why don't you just do a podcast? As soon as you try to do a podcast, we sound like a bunch of muppets. Novi, welcome, mate. I guess we'll, hey, kick things, we'll kick things off, the elephant in the room. How are you doing? Looks like you've, you've had your first rinse in about three weeks. Yeah, I just got a late late call up to the podcast and found out that um, it was a video one, so I thought I'd have a quick quick shower. Down to one week, one day, one shower a week at the moment, so I uh, brought it forward a day early and uh, ready to go, fresh as daisy. Oh, it's, it's good of you to jump in the rain room for us, boys. Um, so you're in Spain, uh, just like me. Uh, Spain's become one of the epicenters of, of this virus over here in, in Europe. So there's some pretty pretty tough restrictions going on. Um, how, are you, how are you dealing with it, with it all, with these big lockdowns? And obviously, they've been extended by another few weeks. So you must be going a bit stir crazy like the rest of us. Yeah, obviously, first, uh, first lockdown, you sort of prepared for 15 days and then extended another 15. And now I guess they've gone another 15, so it's, uh, yeah, definitely going a bit stir-crazy, but um, dealing with it all right. Keep myself amused, bit of puzzle time. Um, the odd podcast here and there, reading the book, just trying to, uh, when the, when Spain puts on the sun like it has this morning, it uh, makes the makes the day go a lot better, get outside, get a bit of vitamin D. When I called you the other week, mate, you had the was jig out, looked pretty complicated. What were you building? Well, I'm still not 100 percent sure. Oh, is, that the, is, that the, is that the sort of the thrill of it? You don't know what the was jig is. The famous was jig. You're looking at you're you're puzzling what they're looking at on the box. So it uh, doesn't have any color coordination. Doesn't have anything really anything to go off. You just sort of make it as you go, which is great in a time like this because I'm just spacing it out 50 odd pieces a day to make it really last. You've got to start with the edges. You starting with the edges. Always start with the edges on a puzzle. Bills, you know that. Good man. You know, Edges first, work your way in. Um, Maria, obviously my girlfriend here, who I'm in lockdown with, sort of chips in every now and then, but she's not real keen on it. She's uh, claims this one's too hard for us, but uh, I've got the time to do it, so we can do it. So Maria's still your girlfriend three weeks in. Well, she's still my living companion. I don't know if she's my girlfriend as such. Um, I guess we'll negotiate that after the time we the first day back out in the real world. Well, it's not, it's not really the time for her to move out, is it? Yeah, she can, she's got nowhere to go. I mean, she knows where the door is, but uh, she's not. Uh, she can't. T- she can't use it. So, thankfully for me, I've been hearing rumours, mate, that you've uh, reverted back to to communications from the from the eighteen hundreds, and you're now screaming at bills from across the street. Um, what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I share the neighbourhood with bills. He la, uh, well, about. I reckon Bolty could throw the tennis ball to him, but I couldn't. It's just a bit too far for me to hit him with a, a tennis ball. But, uh, yeah, every day we see him out in the terrace doing the same as me, getting the vitamin D in, so um, have a quick yarn. But last time we did it, it was about four, four, or five, four or five days ago, and there was a bit of traffic noise, actually, surprisingly, at that time. So uh, it was hard to communicate exactly. Couldn't quite hear him, but I got the gist of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a bit worried about it. I've had to shut down these conversations, like, so so the situation is me and Novi, we live we live about 100 metres apart from each other and our terraces face each other. So the first couple of weeks of the lockdown, we're having a few yelling conversations uh, across the streets. But last Sunday, I was I was sitting out on my terrace and, and uh, on my street, this guy started playing piano. And you guys probably would have seen videos of, of things happening in Italy, of, of communities getting involved and, and singing songs and playing music to each other across across the balconies. And the same thing happened here. And it was it was a Sunday morning. The sun was out. <clears throat> Everyone was out on their terraces. And this guy started playing some classical music. And he had the 
had a blasting through his piano and he was singing and at one point there was even old couples on on their terraces dancing and everyone was just it was awesome you know it went for about 20 or 30 minutes the whole street was clapping every time they every time he stopped singing and and then all of a sudden after about half an hour <coughs> this dude poked his head out the window he's like <laughs> shut up turn that music off and then and then everybody started yelling at him like, mate, we're all enjoying it. What's the problem? He's like, turn that shit off. So then now I'm a bit scared about yelling across the street to Nobby because I'm worried about old mate poking his head out and having a crack at me. I didn't actually, uh, unfortunately, the piano didn't travel as far as me. But I don't know if you heard two days ago the guy murdering the saxophone. <laughs> he, he, he definitely should have got told to shut up. He was terrible. <laughs> you're, like, you're like bleeding Gums Murphy from The Simpsons. Oh, no, Bleeding Gums had a bit of chewed about it, a bit of, <laughs> bit of, bit of swagger. This guy had nothing. Oh, it's horrible. I was, thankfully, his parents, I hope it was a kid, took it off him and said, actually, maybe this can uh, wait until you can get out in the park and no one can hear you. Wait till you learn how to play it. Exactly. <laughs> mm. um, so, anyway, so you... oh, sorry, sorry, Bills. Go yeah, back. Oh, I thought we'd just talk about... Um... Other, other things you've been doing to keep sane? What, what else is going on? Oh, the, uh, not much, to be honest. Doing a bit of bike riding, a bit of Zwifting. Inside. How's that going for you? Inside only, obviously. Um, I think the only time I've been outside is shopping once per week, sometimes twice. So How, all the... how strict are they down here? Because we're, we're, I'm up, obviously, in Andorra, and uh, I'm looking out the window, and they're, they're on full lockdown. You know, we've got cop cars going around every time. Came across a couple of cops sitting up with binoculars yesterday, just scouting out um, people going rogue into the hills. Um, even car stops now just stop you if you just go in the supermarket, check you got shopping bags with you, check you got a shopping list, that kind of thing. Um, even if you're not, even if you're stepping out of your zone, you know we live right at the top of the hill here, no, no supermarkets. So if you're heading down the sort of Lavea, which is that city down the bottom, and you've you've passed Caneo, which is a small town on the way down, and you've and they stop you and ask you where you're going, and you say you go to the supermarket, they'll they'll find you because you've you haven't gone to your local supermarket. So it's um yeah I don't know I don't know where where they've been more strict, but I think all of us are a lot worse off than people back home right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, you only have to read on Facebook what's happening in New Zealand, and people are taking it half seriously and half not. I see yesterday they banned. Well, they're enforcing the ban on surfing, so people are still getting out for a surf. Um, here in Girona, we do not have any of those luxuries. Um, technically, legally, you need a piece of paper to be in the street saying where you're going, where you live, and it's obviously between A and B. You have to be between somewhere between the two, and I think they enforce that for the police to uh, be able to do more rapid checks to be able to uh, stop people in the street, read your paperwork. If you don't have your paperwork, you get a fine. Um Unfortunately for me, the paperwork situation, I don't have a printer, so that's not, ha that's not happening. But so what did you get done on the way to get a printer? Yeah, no, there's no printers for sale anyway. Oh, oh, so. I, actually, I got pulled up the other day by the cops, actually, walking to the supermarket. And, and they, they, were, they were fine. They weren't, being, they weren't being volatile or anything. They were pretty friendly, but they, they just wanted an explanation. So had to spend about five minutes on the side of the street explaining what I was doing, where I was going, where I lived, how long I was going to be out for. So, I mean, that's, that's an inconvenience, but it's, it's certainly necessary. And, and you've got to take your hat off to the, to the way they're the policing it over here, I reckon. And also, you've got to, the, the, you've got to take your hat off to, to the medical centres at the moment. You, you see over here in Spain and all, all across Europe, <clears throat> at 8 p.m. every night, everyone goes out on their balconies and, and there's just a deafening, deafening applause across the, across the cities. Um, and that's everybody giving giving a hand to the to the medical staff and all the hospitals. So I've been I've certainly been getting out there at eight PM every every evening and, and clapping for five or ten minutes and seeing you and your terrorists doing the same thing, Novi. Yeah, I'm embarrassed to admit I haven't been out there every evening because uh, <coughs> sometimes I don't hear it if the window's not open, if we don't have sunshine that uh, that particular day it's a bit cold so the doors are shut. So I can't yeah, you got you got a clock though, haven't you? It's 8 p.m. the same time every day. Yeah, with 21 days, you lose track of time, mate. Lose track of days. You sort of just, it all blurs into one. I'd say I've got an 80% success rate of getting out there, though. So I do, my, I do my part when I can. Depends. I can maybe see I'm... Bill's stepping out on his veranda just for a bit of, just, you know, soak up the applause, maybe, maybe pretend it's for him. 
Um, yeah, I've seen a couple of people. I've seen it looked like he was bowing. I didn't know what he was doing. I yeah. thought he was just, I thought well, he was you, just can, you can see I've been out there because the wind's blowing my hair up. <laughs> yeah, the old What's going on there? You slept on a. Surprisingly. Oh, off in the way I slept. It's like something old, about Mary. You're going the opposite. You're face, facing me. The, technically, the mullet should be going this way. But uh, obviously, I've had a shower today and brushed it out. So I've lost the wind. The wind mold. Um, look, let's let's talk about about a little bit about cycling. Um, What's that? Well, I've, I just noticed that bike behind you, Novi. The well, half a bike. <laughs> What's what the hell is going on with that frame? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that was going to turn into something. It's um, a few years ago after my crash in the Tour de France in 2016, I sort of got gifted it from the team, which. At the time, was a bit of a harsh reality, a harsh, harsh gift. But uh, I'm keeping that for the pool room when I have a bigger apartment and a bit more space to be able to um, branch out, I guess, and turn, a, turn it into a man cave. This is at the moment uh, not the man cave. This is the office where my girlfriend works. So, um, yeah, the bike's just sort of filling in spaces up there at the moment. But, yeah, that I was... Uh, I reckon I was the last person to see that bike whole, actually. I, yeah, I, yeah. I you had a bird's, right behind bird's, you, eye, bird's eye view of me going down, GB. Um, unfortunately for me, I was tucked between two Kiwis that, that were in the same race at the same time with Hendy in front of me and you behind me. Thankfully, uh, you, didn't, you didn't get to witness it firsthand, only uh, eyewitness. I guess I guess that bike is sort of a bit of a symbol of, of um, – a good opportunity to move on to your national nationals victory this this year. Um, you know that was about four or five years ago now, wasn't it? That crash and and that sort of that started a real tough time for you. You you broke your pelvis and you were you were out for most of the season that year, and then you came back and then that that created issues with your back and you lost a whole another season again. And because of that, you you lost a, your contract, unfortunately. But Good old Timaru boy, you fought back, and now you're you're riding for one of the biggest teams in the world, and and I guess that uh, that national title you won in January this year was it was pretty emotional. We we all saw that, and you and you when you when you crossed the line, and I guess beating George that day was was also a bonus. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say it was a bonus beating beating George. Um, it was definitely one of the better days I've had on the bike, and. As we all know, they don't they don't come around very often. Days like that, where everything just clicks and falls into place. But um, it was all about bringing the fern to Europe, and uh, I managed to do my part and bring the fern to Europe. Just unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, I don't get to race it. So yeah, you want, uh, you want to only, you want to, chuck, you want to chuck that jersey on now so everyone can see it. It might be their only chance. Oh yeah, probably <laughs> probably should have. If we're still here in November, maybe I can do another. Uh, Another lockdown cameo for you boys, and uh, chuck the kit on and get, get Mate, a scene work, get it worldwide. Be, in November, we're going to be debuting the Team New Zealand at the Tour of Southland. So, uh, we're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are the way the racing season's going, we will be uh, chasing race days, GB, and why Marvin, not? Back, no better race to, in the world. Exactly, Mate, cut your teeth on Southland Roads. Cut everything on Southland Roads. Yeah. Um, but no, back to back to Nationals in February. Um, for me, obviously, getting second, um, I came across the line. I was destroyed physically, been out all by myself. And I have to say, when I heard your speech, I did get a little emotional. And I felt when I heard how much it meant to you. I think the best part of it for me was was actually finally being in a finished photo of the of the nationals, where they didn't pull the fingers at me. The winner didn't pull the fingers at me. That was a nice change. Yeah, obviously. Uh... I didn't have too much time to plan my salute. I would have liked to pull the fingers at you, George, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just uh, I, I, you, I would have, but I would have just been counting the amount of victories I had. Actually, I would have actually been pulling the fingers at you. <laughs> yeah. I think that was all mate's excuse when he pulled on. Was it that, or was it he, no, he yeah. gave me the finger? Yeah. As in, he had, I've uh, won twice. Yeah, won twice. One of hand. I I would have had a one arm one arm salute because I'm not very good at taking my hands off my bars. So it just would have been the one finger. But, you had enough time to celebrate, mate. You managed to put about five seconds into me in the 50 meter sprint we did. Yeah, it's true. It was in a, definitely an emotional, uh, emotional to get the win. Obviously, um, I made a joke to Maria the other day that uh, <laughs> this is going to be another interrupted season, so it's going to be my fifth 
interrupted pro season. Um, last year, obviously, starting a little bit late, uh, being amateur the first three months and then pro for nine months. And now this year, another whole bunch of racing injuries the previous years and crashes and a team folding and all that type of thing. So it, uh, it adds to the book at the end of the career, that's for sure. Well, some people are campaigning maybe to, if we don't get to race, to actually give you another year in the jersey. Um, I'm give not. the mullet another year. Give the mullet yeah. another year. Yeah. Hashtag give the mullet Hashtag another give year. Give the mullet another year. And if they have to have nationals, some people have even proposed that they just take out Mangakawa and make it a bunchy, and that's pretty much like giving you another national title. I wouldn't be so lucky two years in a row, Georgia. I think if they did that, it would be uh, another interesting race like nationals always is. Um, oh, I'm campaigning the other <laughs> way, mate. I, I, you've had your turn. I'm sick of I'm, I'm campaigning to chuck in another six laps in Mangakawa. So um, still won't win, but, you know, wow. it's just nice to share it around, isn't it? I'd hate to break it to you, but going back to the lockdown situation, if they do, if they do carry on the way they go, and the next step is uh, full lockdown, not going out. So I'll also be fifty-two kilo when we line up for nationals in January. <laughs> <laughs> no food, um, just pure, pure, uh, well, like you, a pure bull of muscle, skeleton, mm. skeleton with muscle. Skeleton was the muscle, big Belgian bull, big Belgian um, bulls. So yeah, obviously, obviously, Novi, you're the you're the first first world tour pro to bring the bring the jersey to Europe since Hayden Rolston did in 2014, and I guess that name Hayden Rolston, he's 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 had a pretty big impact on your life in a lot of different ways. But correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure Roly was the instigator of the of that mullet you've got there, those beautiful locks. Yeah, it was a a late night conversation um, fueled by a lot of carbohydrates. Back in uh, 2006, 2007, I think I was fresh, fresh 18 year olds. Must have been. I was in a bar. Nah, I wasn't. Yeah, it was before. Me. It was prize giving, but I, I wasn't fueled by carbohydrates. <laughs> Demented carbohydrates. And um, yeah, it was a, it was a deer. I already had a bit of a, bit of a small mullet, or what people call a mullet, I guess. Not in my terms, a mullet, but. Um, if I was to grow it, I was fundraising at the time for the Junior World Championships. So if I was to grow it for a full year, they were going to chip in Hayden being one guy and Nathan Dixon, a Timaru local, another thousand dollars each. Um, I went forward and did did the deal. Grew it for a year. Grew it for another year after that, and a third year after that. Didn't get any of the money. Obviously, um, they obviously forgot about it. But and then it became part of me. The mullet. It's been with me ever since. So have they ever paid you? Or they still haven't? One did. Nathan did. Hayden oh, we... still Hayden still yet to pay. <laughs> Typical roles to know. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll have to get him on here next time and give him a shit about not paying you. Maybe we start another hashtag, pay the mullet. Hashtag hey, pay yeah. the mullet. Oh, obviously, I don't need the money like I did back then. Uh, I funded my junior oils and I got what I needed to out of it and I've carried on to a not a bad career, but I'm sure we can find some uh, worthy cause for the money to go to. Well, I've already... I've seen that um, worthy cause. I remember back in, I was sitting in a bar, I reckon about 2 a.m., 2011 maybe, um, sitting in Bar Luca in after Tour of Southland and watched some skinhead walk in, try to walk in, looking like, <laughs> yeah. looking like Ed Norton out of American History X, got the boot from the security guards. What well, was that all about? It was quoted by the Southland Times to be, Resembling something from Romper Stomper, actually. I read the article. I was sitting on a plane two days later. Yeah. For people that don't know, um, was it 2011, 2010? 12. 12? Oh, man. Post, Post-Olympics. Yeah. And uh, Post, raising European money gender. for what? Uh, Child Cancer. Child Cancer Foundation. And you raised quite a bit, right? Oh, I can't remember the exact figure. It was over ten grand New Zealand in the end. It was so quite, it was quite a bit of money. Well, maybe we get Roly instead of Roly giving you the grand. Maybe let's get Roly. Let's petition to get Roly to donate that grand to Child Cancer. Do his bit. Well, I'll give him two options. Well, uh, he can donate the money, or he can ride to our south and with us this year. Well, he'll but he'll come and win it probably. We know what I'm doing. King of well, South. Right. We'll, we'll put him in our team so he can win it, and then. Uh, we don't have to do too many indoor session skills. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's ah, not, not a bad idea. We'll get on to them about it. Yeah, let's do it. 
get the roster on. Um, all right, mate. So moving on. Spain's basically extended this until when? 26th of April, something like that. So we've got another three weeks ahead of us at least, but realistically this is going to go a bit longer. Um, I've been in for three weeks. I'm starting to miss things pretty a few things I didn't think I'd miss. What, what's your, what are you going to? What's your first thing you're going to do when you're getting out of here? The first thing I will be getting out of here will be, will be on the bike. It'll be, uh, I, was, I was thinking about this the other day, and then I realized that if they're going to open it up, it's going to be at midnight. So it'll be early morning out for a ride, probably with Bules to uh, chew the fat face-to-face rather than virtually. And then um, more importantly, it'll be some form of a Catalan lunch, obviously, uh, I've got a few Catalan traditions I like to stick to. Um, don't know exactly what's going to be on the menu, but it'll be a, a long, long lunch, like they like they mm. do traditionally, a couple of hours somewhere here, close to walking distance from Girona. Definitely has to be outside. That'll be that'll be the go-to on the first day for sure. But there's plenty of other things that uh, need to be need to be yeah, seen. I think and it's witnessed. not going to work like that, though, is it? It's going to be it's going to be the first the first thing is going to be you're allowed to walk outside. Secondly, maybe you know you might be able to ride alone. It's going to be it's going to be a slow open up. And I think it like the first step we're going to have is revert revert to like a New Zealand type situation where they're encouraging people to go out for fresh air and they're, they're encouraging people as long as they're doing it, keeping the two meters and all that stuff. Um, did you contemplate heading home? I know um, teammate of mine, Finn Fisher Black, um, he's on the development team for us. He uh, managed to get home, I think, uh, or Paddy Bevan got home back to New Zealand where there's a bit more freedom. Did that cross your mind? Um, it crossed my mind, but I've got my life's pretty much set here anyway, so more or less. Obviously, it would have been good to get home to New Zealand, be able to ride around a narrow 2K block as the restrictions are in New Zealand. Um, for a while there, they were allowed out training and living a normal life, so that would have been pretty good. But now the restrictions are not too far off here, so I'm pretty happy I stayed. I never you, really you thought can't about it. You pedaling in New Zealand still? I think I think you can still ride a little bit, no? From what I read in the government, you're allowed a 2K loop around the house. Obviously, Ooh. people are still, still branching out and doing a bit further than that, but you can train on your own. But I think the biggest thing for me is, obviously, as much as I'd love some fresh air and get the, get the wind back through the mullet, um, I need I need a day to be able to start racing before I'm doing five hour rides. So I wouldn't be doing too much more than I'm doing here anyway. An hour or two a day, three hours, three hours at most, which hasn't quite happened on Zwift yet. But um, I'm not one for mega mega miles. Obviously, I, at this time, I'd love to be doing thirty hour weeks. But um, if I'm not racing, I'm not going to go and bust through thirty hour weeks until I know when the season's yeah. going to start. And we're looking more like. The July start at this stage with Tour of Swiss coming out now. So, um, but if uh, logical thinking would suggest that's going to keep getting pushed further and further, but that's a decision for the UCI, I guess. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would have liked to go back to New Zealand, but um, life's here now, and my girlfriend's here. I wasn't going to leave her in this apartment on her own. So uh, yeah, no, I'm happy here. I'm mm, good not man. happy, not happy, but under the situation, I'm happy enough. But you're not about to jump off the balcony yet. It's going to be. Right. It's actually going to be pretty interesting. Like I think you're right, George. There's going to be a pretty progressive op- opening up of things here. And I just did read this morning that Spain's going to increase the lockdown until the 26th of April. But from Easter onwards, they're going to start a progressive, progressive op- open of things. So non-essential businesses may be able to go back to operating, and just a slow, slow um, opening basically over the course of a few weeks. But I, I think it's going to be real interesting to see. I think the fear factor is going to be around for a long time. You know, this virus is this virus isn't going away, and obviously people are going to want to want to get out and do things once we're allowed to. But it's hard to see people rushing to nightclubs and, and piling into small rooms. I mean, the fear factor is going to be hanging around for a, for a long, long time. Oh, mate, the world's not going to be the same for years. No matter everything we do is going to be affected in some way or another. And the the thing is with the strategies they're doing over here, it's no end game. We're no. I mean, we're treating water. We're trying to stop the spread, but eventually, you know, we open things back up. We're going to start getting a spread again, aren't we? So either we we wait it out, lock down for a vaccine, or they do open up sectors and try and encourage some some community spread through um, through like a healthy population, you know, young through a demographic that have less of a chance of sort of filling up hospital beds and things like that. 
and try and achieve some kind of herd immunity. But at some stage, you lock us down for you know eighteen months while the while we wait for a vaccine, and then the, the cure becomes worse than the than the issue in some regards, and and that you ended up with a whole lot more sort of human suffering that might last years in terms of sort of the effect on the economy, the effect on mental you know mental health and social well being, and all a lot. There's a lot of factors that you know you know you have to look at as, as an economy with a lower sort of um, socioeconomic sort of portfolio and that they have a, a hugely lower life expectancy and you drop a you drop that down a bit in every country and, and the total amount of sort of impact on health is is um is affected so there's so many things they're gonna have to work out and yeah. uh, you're a brave man to make those calls but governments make those calls every day i mean they, they look at pharma like what what who's being what drugs are being funded by pharma tech or, or what how much they're going to invest in each health sector, and they they do put a price on life every day. Even though you know we can say that's an immoral thing to do, it, it does it does happen. And I think unfortunately in this in this case they're going to have to do that as well. Jeez, mate, you you actually have got something in that head of yours. <laughs> <laughs> you, do you know what you reminded me of? You reminded me just then of have you seen that movie Old School when when they they have to <laughs> they have to do their exam to the- get the <laughs> To get the thing, and Will Ferrell does that speech about like socio-economical things, and he just like blacks out and just goes like in the debate in the debating hall. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what you look like just then. I'm glad this. I'm glad this isn't a debate, boys, because I just yeah, come come on, come on the first potty, have it, have a yarn to the boys, and now I'm sitting up. Sorry, mate. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, I'm, I'm feeling gave me a headache. I'm feeling frustrated because I'm uh, doing stupid shit. Like we're we're getting arrested for walking outside, and I I I understand the need to do it, but. I'm feeling bad for people here because there's, there's. I look out my window and there's, there's twenty people there, right? And they're fine. They got a dog. They're walking a dog, and dogs. Don't get me wrong. I, I love dogs. They need to get fresh air. But there's a family like sitting next, to, like in the room next to us, right? There's five of them in a two bedroom play. And I went down to the garage, got a big underground parking the other day, and there was this, the granddad was walking the the toddler around, just walking them around and around in circles. And we, you guys both know. Our car park is a pretty grim, dark underground area. Just walking around in circles with this toddler, and I was like, "Mate, this toddler needs air. this toddler needs as much fresh air as a dog." So, as long as they're not getting close to someone, let these like I'm fine. Wow. I'll, I'll I mean, survive. So, at the end so of the day, like what what Spain's done is 100 percent necessary. Like it's under it's, yeah. it's out of control here, and, and as hard as it is, it's really important that they've done this and. Look, people are going to flaunt the rules. That's that's just the way. That's just what people do. But I just think that all we can do, we can't control those people. But it, it's our responsibility to do our part, and and that means that we have to we have to follow the rules because that's what we want to do, and that's we want to see this this country and this this global crisis end at some point. And the sooner we we react, the, the sooner we're going to see end. the mullet on the bike. Yeah, exactly. see it flying in the wind again. As soon as us three can get back on the bike together, but I think you're right. Spain had to take the the big uh, the big steps that they have and uh, stop everything. And I think the numbers show 21 days into quarantine, and the numbers are only just plateauing. It shows they don't know everything about the virus, and they don't know uh, what the next steps are. All we can hope for is it means us getting outside sooner rather than later. But um, like you said, George, there's experts are. Experts mm. are paid to make expert decisions, and we can only uh, we can only sit back and wait and see what happens, but um, and try and stay as mentally healthy as possible because that is key at this stage. How like, sick uh, do you think people are of of hearing about coronavirus? And do you think anyone cares what three cyclists' opinions are really? When there's, I mean, I'm 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 overexposed to it, man. I'm actually I'm actually getting the crack on it where I I need to stop talking about it. I think I'll tell you what, the one, the, one good, the one good thing about being in Spain during this is that every evening when um, the President Sanchez does his, does his press release, you get to see him on TV because he's a handsome man, actually. He's a good-looking guy, he's isn't he? He's a good-looking guy, yeah. Did you know this, Bills? Have you noticed this? Oh, does he like Will Farrell again and Carlos Nights? Does, does his hand come up? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he just talks to his hands. He doesn't know what to do with them. He doesn't like... <laughs> so he is like Will Farrell. There's a Man, lot of strip, Will strip, strip, strip them back. I don't know. Put them in your pocket. I've been tuning into the 8 p.m. the 8 p.m. Uh, broadcast. Hey, I think she's got the hots for Sanchez. Who? Oh, oh, Pedro. Yeah. Pedro. Caitlin. 
Oh, I do. He's so handsome. He's a good looking man. Yeah. But he's got think, Corona. I think if he knew what he was saying exactly word for word, we probably wouldn't like him so much. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if he's super popular, is he? Yeah. <laughs> not, not up in these parts of North Spain. I mean, I'm not going to get into <laughs> a political, political debate. <laughs> no, let's not do that. Let's not do that. <laughs> but uh, I don't think he's really, really well liked by everyone in the country, just yeah. like every political leader. But yeah. no, the they got in, don't seem to love him too much, do they? They're paid to make decisions and they got their job one way or another. And uh, hopefully, hopefully only the right decisions are being made. I, I think that we should not talk about politics anymore. Yep, we talked about it for about fifteen seconds. That's enough. So I want to, I want to, um, I want to talk about mullets again because I just, I'm, I really, I love Shane's mullet. But I've done some research myself, and I've come up with five, five forgotten mullets that I reckon are some of the best Oof. mullets. And I think that I think Shane can maybe be able to offer some insight on this. And I've. I've come up with five people who I reckon have the best mullets of all time. And the first one is Andre Agassi. Even though it was fake, Agreed. it was a it was a hell of a rug. It was a hell of a rug. Agreed. Sweet band. A lot of sweet band. Just, a lot maybe of we could get maybe we could get um, Nov to, to judge. We both put our, our five mullets forward, and then we 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 get Novi to at the end of this to say um, whose whose selection he thinks is better. Right, I'll run through. I'll run through my five then. So number one, Andre Agassi, fake but great. Number two, Ellen DeGeneres, when she first when she first kicked off her stand up. Stop throwing those coins around, mate. When she first kicked <laughs> off her, that he's still getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> when he started, when she started her stand up, she had a hell of a she had a hell of a mullet. Number three, Michael Bolton, another another yeah. great mullet and. In the 1980s, it was a shoulder-length mullet, and I, it's, there, there must have been an inspiration for, for Novi with his one. Four, Kenny Powers from Eastbound and Down. Just, that, the, mullet. The, mullet, the mullet with the most swag, no doubt. And then I think, undeniably, one of the most famous mullets of all time, Billy Ray Cyrus. That's my five. All right, that's a good lineup. All right, I'm going to hit you with opening, opening with my five. Um, Rod Stewart. Oof, Great is... Yep. Um, more relevant, uh, Jack Goodhue. He's a, he's a current All Black. Uh, um, doing great things with his mullet. Barely um, touches the collar. <laughs> 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 as I said, okay. as I said, a seventeen-year-old, it wasn't a mullet yet. But <laughs> okay, I'm I'm I'm, I'm fast-forwarding Jack Goodhue five years. Um, <laughs> Right, number three, I'm going to go with Scarlett Johansson. That was Ooh. a very sexy mullet. Scarjo. Yeah. Um, number four, I'm going to go with the creator of um, Life in the Peloton podcast, a friend of all of ours, Mitchell Docker. Yeah. Um, the thing I like about Mitch's mullet is the accompanying slug on the, oh, on the lip. So that's, I just think it's a good combo. And, and for me, my favorite mullet of all time, and actually this guy was a hero of mine when I first started cycling. Um, apparently he's flipping fancy cars down south in southern Spain somewhere now, but Vladimir Carpets. Um, oh, Vladimir. Yeah. So he was a, a I grew mullet. up watching that guy, and that was a glorious mullet. I think that was, I mean, there was obviously Laurent Bouchard, the world champ. Um, he, had a, he had a glorious mullet. But for me, Carpets was the, was the original cycling mullet. Um, but yeah, I think I think you're you're fast on track to to surpass him. I'm surprised actually you brought up carpets. I was thinking Fignon the whole time, and then uh, oh, obviously, no, obviously, just, obviously, oh, obviously there is wind, Mitch. Yeah, there is Mitch with the slug. Um, great appreciation for Mitch's uh, fashion statements. That's for sure. Mm. Um, good Hugh. The only credit I'll give him as it started as a team bet from what I understand, and he was the last man standing. But never quite, I don't know how the length is now, but during the World Cup or whatever, it wasn't... Uh, yeah, it was missing a bit, wasn't it? It wasn't It wasn't to a full length. I wouldn't give it the mullet status, but he did. The All Blacks generally have quite tidy looks, so he did uh, go against a lot of uh, a lot of books in that respect. Go against the grain of um, Female mullets, I mean, yeah, you could say oh, she, was quite, quite, she was quite sexy. I mean... Okay. Alan's not Alan's not saying I'm sexy, so I can't exactly say she is either. So, um, but I'm only gonna I'm not gonna rank them to ten. That's just a few talking. I just want to know whose up. lineup do you prefer? Who's put together a, a tighter five? Oof. 
I'll probably go with you, George. A few more Thanks, close mate. to home. Thanks, mate. Appreciate sorry, it. sorry, Bills, but I will Don't say feel bad about rolling them at nationals, eh? <laughs> 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 I will say that Agassi, Agassi is the number one. Um, obviously, the mullet, but I'm not a big reader. I am at the moment. I'm in the quarantine phase, but uh, great book, great book, Peter for great mullet. Mm, that was a great. I book. got some gripes with that book. I mean, a great. I, I still have a playlist called Belly Aches that, that um, you know, it was a, if you've read if you've read Agassi's book, he would basically, when he felt sad, create a, the saddest playlist he could and just embrace it. Drive around with this terrible playlist and. But there's a few things in that book that just don't add up for me. Um, and one of them is that he's a heroic – I mean, this is probably getting into an area we don't really need to talk about, but um, I can cut it. Um, <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is basically that, uh, you know, if any other sportsman or any other – I mean, especially in cycling or – athletics or something talked about midway through a match go off get a cortisone injection and you back come back on and you're a hero whereas anyone else does that mate that's it, it's cheating you can't do that but for the rest i love the book but mm. maybe we maybe we don't need to talk about that so i think we should probably uh people are probably getting sick of our dribble mate so i think we should probably start to, to wrap this up eh? yeah well it's been bloody good to talk to you mallet virtually <laughs> But but easier to talk to you here than yelling across the balcony. But like you say, mate, I hope that we can actually get out on the bike and um, like the rest of the world at some point soon and be able to converse and and uh, and live our lives again. But for now, keep staying aside, mate. Like everyone, look after yourself, stay healthy, and thanks for coming on the, the first step of social distance. Thanks, boys. Uh, it's a great pleasure for you to fill fill in an hour of my day. Um, if you want to have the same chat offline. I've got another hour or two up my sleeve that uh, you are more, more than happy to keep talking shit if you want. Mate, so. I've got too much social distancing to do, so I think I'm going to have to leave you to it. How long are podcasts allowed to be? We could keep this going all day. It would be yeah. the first six-hour podcast. <laughs> we could maybe live stream my Zwift attempt when I'm going on this Hope route this afternoon. No, oh, mate. I'm coming 1500th in that overall at the moment. And hey. Jack. Due to the current climate, the uh, people probably have six hours. They want to listen to our podcast, so exactly, you, might, you can make a world first. I like listening right. to my voice, so I'll listen to it again. <laughs> uh, record it for six hours, listen for six hours. That kills the whole day. Oh, I'm getting sick of you guys. I'm, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Righto, guys. Cheers for tuning in, guys. We'll see you on Thanks, the Thanks, boys. Oh, shit. Yo. See ya.